Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Praise the Lord. It's good to worship God, to give him all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. You know, we get blessed when we worship him. We get to offload our our weight and our heaviness, but even if none of that occurred, we need to praise God because he's worthy of the praise. He is God Almighty, and so uh, we all did a good job worshiping him tonight. Thank you for uh, giving God all the praise, honor, and glory. Uh, we appreciate you. got a number of you online tonight. We thank you for uh, being part of our church service today. Uh, we got some logged on from London. Thank you for being part of our service today. We're going to move right ahead and pick up this uh, evening's offering. Uh, today we just ask, you know, that the Lord would uh, move upon your heart and that you would want to give and you would want to give him all the praise and that you would uh, uh, have a heart that says yes to Jesus and yes to the things of God. Thank you for those that have been participating and been involved in giving, uh, some of you for for literally years or even longer decades, you know, so grateful for you uh, and your giving. And so let the Lord bless you tonight. We're going to go ahead and pray, ask the Lord to bless this offering, even if we're giving by a bank transfer, uh, it is a good offering to the Lord. So bow your heads and we'll pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give to your kingdom. We ask, Lord, that you bless each person as they give. I pray for those who gave last Sunday. I pray for those who give this Wednesday. I pray in advance for those who are going to give this coming weekend. Lord, thank you for meeting every one of their needs. Bless them. Encourage them. Let their hearts be right before you. And Lord, we thank you for all of this today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. I uh, want to remind you all, too, we have our Zoom Bible study that's going to be on this Sunday night. Uh, of course, we have service at our usual time of 11 a.m. will be online only uh, this Sunday, uh, but we will have our Zoom Bible study. Uh, if you haven't received your uh, worksheet yet, uh, please let Pastor Allen know. He sent it out. Hopefully, everybody uh, received it. If not, we can take care of you. If you would like to participate, you can also uh, get involved by just giving us an email address so we can give you the link to the Zoom meeting. Praise God. Uh, I think that's all we want to mention uh, today. We want to go ahead and get into the Word of God. So why don't you get out your devices or your Bible, uh, whichever way, but we're going to look into the Word of God here in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7. I'll give you a minute just to get there. Praise God. Also, we've been posting our uh, online services uh, always through the podcast. Uh, you can definitely get the audio there. We've also been doing videos on our YouTube channel, so uh, you're more than welcome to gander at those if you fancy. So we have those available for you. Judges chapter 7, we'll be getting there to that passage in just a minute. The title of today's message is Blessings You Can Bank On. Blessings You Can Bank On. Actually, these are blessings that you get when you go to the bank and you get out money and you give it to the Lord. And so I want to talk with you tonight about uh, money and the Christian life. I know it's, it's controversial in many ways and many aspects of it, and people have different attitudes towards it, but the Bible is clear about Christians and how they handle their money and specifics uh, in giving to the Lord. Uh, I was reading about a man named Eric Hulstrand, and he was preaching, and he said this in, in one of his articles that he wrote. He said, while I was preaching one Sunday... 
an elderly woman, Mary, fainted and struck her head on the end of the pew. Immediately, an EMT in the congregation called for an ambulance. They strapped her to a stretcher and got ready to head out the door. Mary uh, regained consciousness, and so she motioned for her daughter to come near. Everyone thought she was summoning her strength to convey what could be her final words. Her daughter leaned over until her ear was at her mother's mouth, and her mother whispers, My offering is in my purse. This woman understood giving, understood more than giving. She understood stewardship. It was extremely important to her. And that's a big question we should ask ourselves tonight is how important is stewardship? You may say, what is a steward or what is stewardship? Uh, The definition is simple. It's a person who is responsible for another person's property. It's a person who's responsible for another person's property. And so as Christians, we are in a key position. We are key workers, so to speak, in the kingdom of God to be stewards of what God has in doing God's will and God's work on the earth. I know most Christians don't think like that, but we need to. John Wesley said these words, he wrote these words. He said, when the possessor of heaven and earth brought you into being and placed you in this world, he placed you here not as an owner, but as a steward. As such, he entrusted you for a season with goods of various kinds, but the sole property of these still rests in him, nor can ever be alienated from him. As you are not your own, but his, such is likewise all you enjoy. Mr. Wesley was saying that we need to recognize that all that we have, our life's breath comes from God. Our material possessions, our blessings from God. And one of the barometers of our Christian life, one of the things that measures our health in the area of our life is our stewardship. If we can be good stewards, it shows our spirituality is strong. We're talking about money today. We're going to talk about tithing today. But I want to also tell you that stewardship applies to our time. Do you use your time for the Lord? Do you use what you have, your energy, your talents, your gifts? For God. See, stewardship is important. Specifically this evening, we want to look at our attitudes concerning giving to the work of the Lord. Because there are some people who don't give to God because they just don't want to give. They feel like their money belongs to them. Others give, but they have a bad attitude. Either way, those are wrong uh, perspectives on giving. We should be Christians who have good attitudes when it comes to giving to the Lord. Even though scripture is clear, the need and the use of finances can be one of the most divisive issues in Christianity. People look at it as being wrong. You should do this with the money. You should only give this if you can afford it. You shouldn't be asking people to give. They should give. A, there's all kinds of statements that are out there, but the Bible is so clear on this issue. Before we get into the book of Judges, looking at this story of Gideon in just a moment, there are a few quotes I'd like to quote to you of some people who said some things about giving. George Mueller, a great uh, uh, philanthropist, Christian guy, man of faith, uh, he said, God judges what we give by what we keep. Another man, Martin Luther, you know him, he's a great reformist, German reformist. He says, I have tried to keep things in my hands and lost them all, but what I have given into God's hands, I still possess. J.D. Rockefeller, a rich American, said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 per week. (laughs) Peter Marshall, a great Scottish preacher who uh, left Scotland and went to America to preach in Washington, D.C., he said, give according to your income, 
lest God make your income according to your giving. I read that, I said, whoa, that strikes to the heart right there. Finally tonight, Mother Teresa, the great uh, uh, worker of the streets, helper of the poor, she says, if you give what you do not need, it is in giving. (laughs) I like all of those quotes today. So today, like I said, we're going to look at this story of Gideon and see how it applies to our stewardship and applies to how we should give and our attitude in giving. So let's read the book of Judges, chapter 7, and starting at verse 9. We're going to read all the way down through verse 22, big long passage, but let's read it together. This is the New International Version, the NIV, if you want to follow along. It says, during that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm giving, I'm going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp And the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as the man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and it collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into the three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had changed the guard, and they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. Verse 20 says, The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. And they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shitha towards Zerara, uh, as far as the border of Abel Meholah near Tabith. And so... Here we have this passage here of God using Gideon to make a difference and defeat the enemy. He had to use the resources that God had given him. He was a good steward, so to speak, over those resources. And so before we get into the four things that we need to look at tonight, I want to remind you that stewardship uh, comes down to trust and lordship. Who do you trust and who's lord of your life? Because when we come to our finances, when it comes to giving, when it comes to any aspect really, but specifically with giving, who we trust and who's lord of our lives will determine who we give to and how we do it. So first thing I want you to know tonight is that God promises his blessings. God promises his blessings. Verse number nine says, during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. For the third time, I want to say God promises us his blessing. I thank God for his promises. 
I've had to deal recently with men who promised things over the years and, and promised that they would stick to this pattern. And then when the time came, they reneged. And boy, that is discouraging, isn't it? It, it discourages when someone says that they'll do something and then they don't. But the good news is our God, when he promises something to us, he will not renege ever. The Bible says, let every man be a liar. And there's lots of lying men out there, unfortunately, today. But let God be true. And that's good news for you and I today. God, throughout his word, just like he did to Gideon, promises us his blessings. And one of the ways financially that he promises those blessings is through the principle of consistent tithing. In the book of Malachi, we all know it, but let me read it for you again. You can write it down or tap through if you like. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. The Lord is writing here at the last book of the Old Testament and says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. I like that because he's saying, it doesn't matter what season, what dispensation we're in, what time frame we're in. He doesn't change. He says, therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your father, you have gone away from my ordinances. He is kind of criticizing them and disciplining them and explaining that they have moved away from the laws and the plans and the, the, the pathways of God and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. For some of you tonight, that's your message. Return to the Lord and he'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Can I just give you a little hint before we read the rest of the passage there? Whenever God asks you a question or rather makes a command to you, don't ask him a question in return. Just do it. Just obey it. And then they said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Again, with the questioning. Uh, In tithes and in offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So he's chastising the people of God here for moving away from his ordinances. But in verse 10, the grace of God comes out, the favor of God, the blessing of God comes out. And he says, test me in this. He's challenging them, not kind of like with his chest out, like test me, but kind of like saying, come on, why don't you do this so you can see? Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven. Oh, man. And pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Yeah, he corrects them. Yes, he disciplines them, but his goal was to bless them. And he promises you and I blessing if we are willing to go forth and give to the Lord. That's what he's saying here. I want you to give your tithe, your tenth. What was a tenth? Tenth is 10%. We all know that. We all have phones. We can calculate. It's easy. But it also had some specifics to it. It was supposed to be the first fruits the first fruits for them was the best. It was the best. It was first. It was the, the prime. It was the most important. Also, the tithe never, ever belonged to the children of Israel. It didn't belong to them. It was always throughout Scripture. That tenth was the Lord's. That tenth was the Lord. It's funny how people complain about giving a tenth to God when really God owns it all. And he gives us 90. (laughs) He gives us 90. There were other offerings that in the Old Testament that were uh, expected that were above the tithe. And that principle has not changed. God still wants to bless his people uh, as they bless him. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, in verse number 9, this is where it says God is willing to give good gifts to his children. Let me read it for you. 
Or what man is there among you if his son if his son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent if you then being evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him See sometimes because we have asked God and haven't received right away or didn't receive what we wanted from God we tend to think he doesn't really give good things to us he just will dole out as he sees fit I'm here to tell you that we need to keep asking him because this scripture tells us that we can come to God and ask him for the good things that a father would give to his children What is my point? Over and over in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the principle of God blessing his people is there. Giving back to him is a token of gratitude for the blessing that he's given us. Can you say amen? But using our scripture here with Gideon, not only does God promise his blessing, but those blessings require action. They require action. He says, I'm going to give this camp into your hand. But then he says, get up and go down against the camp. And even tells him, look, if you're afraid, you can bring your friend with you. Because he knew how they were. But the bottom line was they had to get down there. It was down there where they began to hear a lot about how God was going to move on their behalf. But my point is, is that there are times When God says, look it, I'm going to give you this, but I need you to do thus. And that's so critical because Christianity in modern times has become a laid back, do little kind of religion. I'm here to tell you, God wants to bless you, but action is required. And giving is part of that action. See, many times people want to receive the blessings of God without showing any kind of action but scripture is filled with God saying I'll give you this but you must do this it's a prerequisite I've got a few scriptures here we're going to put them up on the screen Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over it will be measured into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you Give, you'll be given back. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Matthew six thirty three says, But seek first the kingdom of God. Can't put the kingdom of God second, third, fourth, because you're uh, broke this month, you're going to put him fifth. Can't do that. He has to always be first and his righteousness and all these things then shall be added to you. James tells us clearly in James chapter 2 and verse 26, faith without works is dead. What's my point? If we trust God, if he is Lord over our lives, then we must act. We must take action upon the word that God has laid out for us. Actions are not just any actions that we choose, but actions are designed by God himself, by God himself. The book of Judges, chapter 7, 13 through 15 says, And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I have a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his uh, companion answered and said, 
This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered uh, the Midian and the whole camp. In other words, it's, this is God's design. And in verse 15, and so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise. Remember we learned about that last service. For the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Strange dream. Strange overhearing of this dream. Him and his companion are listening to this. They're a little fearful. They're a little doubtful. They're not sure what to do. But yet they go and they hear this Weird dream about a barley loaf coming into the camp and how that happens to be uh, the sword of Gideon, actually the sword of the Lord, but Gideon is the man. And so God often asks his people to do strange things. And I don't mean strange like bizarre. Sometimes they may seem bizarre, but I'll use the word unconventional. Unconventional. And he told, like, for example, not too long ago, we talked about Naaman and the leper who was told to go uh, wash in the dirty Jordan River. And he did, finally, after he was complaining about it. Did it work? It sure did work. The leper had all kinds of reasons why it wouldn't work, but it finally worked. A lot of people look and think that Christian giving and the way church is presented from the Word of God is a scam. I'm here to tell you because it sounds strange and I know that there are people who have twisted it and I know there are pastors who have twisted it. I know all of that, but the word of God says what it says and it may seem unconventional, but it's God's plan to bless us. Why does God do it unconventionally? I I, I think we could talk a long time about that, but I think one thing you got to grasp is that God wants the credit And he doesn't want man to have the credit. And I think it's important to recognize that, that when we follow God's way of doing it, he receives the credit, not man. There are times when God will ask us to give, and it feels so like, I can't do this. And we end up talking ourselves out of it. Some of you listening to me today, this is your problem, is that you talk yourself out of consistent tithing you talk yourself out of the word that God spoke to you about giving and you pulled back and I'm here to tell you that uh, a lot of times the enemy tries to get us to rationalize things in our mind rather than obey what God says things like I can't afford it you know I want to tell you something we can never really afford it can we we can always find a way to use that money. We can always find something that needs to be paid for. Sometimes the thought comes in your mind, well, if I had more, I'm just a poor person, and so I only have this much, so I'm not, I'm exempt. I'm exempt. You know, uh, some people say, well, I do tithe, but it's by my own standard. I tithe every other paycheck, or (laughs) I tithe 5%, not 10%. Well, it's not really a tithe. That's just 5% giving. Some people feel condemned. I'm so far behind, I can't even get started. There's all kinds of lies that the enemy spreads to you today. My point is telling you today is that God has the design on the actions. He tells us when to do it, how to do it, how much to do it. And he's very, very clear about that. Lies come into our mind very easily. I was reading a story about a mother who wanted to teach her daughter a moral lesson. And so she gave her little girl a 20 pence piece and a pound coin for church. She told her daughter, put whichever one you want in the collection plate and keep the other for yourself. So the girl had to make a decision. Was she going to put in the 20p or the pound coin? And so uh, when they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter uh, which amount she had given. Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the pound, 
But just before the collection, the man in the pulpit said that we should all be cheerful givers. So I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the 20 pence piece, so I did. (laughs) Some of us listen to that lie as well. I want to tell you that it's not easy to obey God, especially in the area of money, especially when we're struggling, especially why, Pastor, are you preaching this now with all of this pandemic, people losing their jobs in record number? That's exactly why I'm talking about this, because we need the hand of God to be involved and interacting and intervening on our behalf. And so this is scripture, and it's so important. Not only do we have to get, perform action to receive blessings from God, and those actions are, have to be designed by God. We have to do the ones that he says. But whatever God designs, he also empowers. He also empowers. The scripture says in verse 22 of our text, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Man, Gideon didn't even have to go in and fight. They destroyed each other. His blessing came because the Lord caused it. I want to ask you today, believer, I want to ask you, Christians who say and claim, and I'm trusting you believe this, that he's Lord of your life. I'm asking you this question. Do you think God can cause things to happen in your life? Things that might not make sense to the outside world. Do you think he can cause money to come to you? Do you think he can cause pay rises? Do you think he can cause bills to be lowered? Do you think he can cause miraculous things to occur in this area? See, God empowers when we obey him. He wants us all to be cheerful givers. He wants us all to be investors in his kingdom. Does that mean if we tithe and consistently give to God that we will never have to sacrifice? Absolutely not. In fact, it may cause us to sacrifice greatly to fulfill what he's actually asking us to do. When I get away from money for a second and begin to talk about, no, let me rephrase that. Let's not talk about money. I want to talk about other things I've had to do for God. There are many things that God has specifically told me to do that was going to be a sacrifice to me personally, my family, my life. And I can tell you that it wasn't like God said, look, I'm going to give you a pile of whatever. I'm going to take care of all of these things and everything's going to be a blessings for you. No, sometimes I had to do them and suffer the consequences of doing righteous things. And I'm here to tell you that you will as well. Giving doesn't mean you're going to always get a lot of money. It doesn't mean that he's going to have money growing on trees in order to help you. When I say and when I mean that God empowers us, uh, I'm meaning to tell you that he'll provide for you in certain ways. He'll strengthen you in other ways. He will discipline and train you and help you through those difficult times. He will make you strong when you thought you were weak. Why? Because he's an empowering God. Remember the story of Elijah when he was there and he goes to that widow's woman house, widow's woman, widow woman's house, and she had oil and the flour in her bins. God caused uh, enough to be there and for it to be overflowing. Why? Because he's an empowering God. So tonight we're closing, <laughs> but I want to ask you this evening. Are you a person that has blessings that you can bank on? Have you been a person that recognizes that God wants to bless you? Have you been an individual that would give to God in a consistent way? I want to tell you, God will provide for you. It shouldn't be harsh in our hearts. It should be a willingness. 
And we have to begin to accept it and hang on to it. We do have to do actions, the actions designed by God. I take him at his word. It's not always easy, but he always empowers us to make it through. Thank you for listening tonight. We're going to close in prayer. And so if you just bow your heads and your hearts with me tonight, we will pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence, to have you in the midst of our lives. I thank you that you're not only here in this building, but you're in each viewer's homes as well. Bless them and help them, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're listening today and you're not a Christian, I'd like to say a prayer. And if you'd like to become a Christian or rededicate your life to Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I dedicate my heart to you. I ask that you would come into my life and change me to be a godly person to live for you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to pray with you tonight. I want to ask if maybe God's been dealing with you. You might have known already that the Lord has, before I even spoke about this, that there were things in your life you need to change financially. Change financially. No one can force you. No one will force you. Churches shouldn't force you. Pastors pastors should not make you feel guilty over giving or not giving. But it would be a disservice of me to not speak to you on this topic or to continually remind you of these things. Because when you read through the scriptures, you can see how God's uh, favor and blessing is upon those who would be willing to take their possessions and give them back to the Lord. So today, I want to pray that you would uh, lean on him, that you would lean on him, that you would obey him, that you would hang on to him. Let's pray today. Lift your hands if you need prayer tonight right there in your home. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are desiring you. I'm asking today for those who are in their homes that need the favor and the blessing of God those who are fearful in their giving, Lord God, help them to recognize that you are a promiser that blesses, that we would be people of action, Lord God, that we would do the actions that you've designed for us to do and recognize your empowerment to fulfill this. Let us not waver or wander as the children of Israel did. Let us stay strong and faithful in your work and in your will. Let us trust you. Let us recognize you as Lord. Help us to live our lives as stewards. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening tonight. I hope you're blessed. I hope you're encouraged, challenged, all of the things that we need from God's word. Look forward to uh, listening or to connecting with you rather again on uh, Sunday morning and then uh, Sunday night seeing you and connecting with you with the Zoom Bible study. So thanks again. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your night. Have a great day at work or school tomorrow. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M3 6BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.